Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Praise God. Good to see everyone this afternoon. As you guys know, it's, it is my tradition to come here at this time of the year. And so it's your pastor's birthday today, just in case you don't know. Um, but because he's not here, the cake that you guys have made him, he said I can have it in his place. Amen. And so it's always a joy to come uh, and minister the word of God here. And so if you have your Bibles this afternoon, this morning, we're going to look in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning to read in verse number 1. I want to use this portion of scripture and I want to minister a message I've entitled Lessons from the Axe Head. Lessons from the Axe Head. And this is a very familiar portion of scripture where the Bible says that Elijah did a miracle by causing uh, an iron axe head to float. And there are a few lessons that I want us to pick up from this text. And so let's read 2 Kings chapter 6. Verse number one, the Bible says, Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there. And let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Verse number six. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place, so he cut off a stick, and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. He made the iron float. Therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. I want you to pray with me this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for every man, woman, boy, girl in this place today. Lord, I pray, God, that your word would encourage. I pray your word would strengthen. I pray your word would convict us, Father. I ask, O oh God, that your word would fall on good ground and that it would bring forth fruit, some 30, 60, and 100 fold. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. And together, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, in this portion of Scripture, we have the account of one of the many miracles performed by Elisha. The Bible begins by telling us about the school of the prophets and how there was growth. Verse number one, the Bible says, Then the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small. Now the school of the prophets were where ministers in training or prophets in training will go and they will begin to learn how to minister the word of God. They begin to learn how to be prophets in the nation of Israel and to be teachers. And so it was the school where all of these young men and all of these men would go so that they can hear from God and they can become skilled in the work of the ministry. And the Bible tells us that the school of the prophet, where they were, that they had outgrown their building. Amen. How many know it is a good problem when you outgrow your building? It won't be long before you outgrow this building. Amen. And so the Bible says, here they are. They've outgrown the building. So they decided to build a bigger building to accommodate the growth. And so what they did now is that they go out into the Jordan and the Bible says they begin to cut down trees so that they can build this place so that they can accommodate all that God wants to do. But while cutting down a tree to build somewhere bigger, we are told that the axe head used to cut the tree came off and fell into the water. Now, one of the things that I find quite interesting is the fact that the man who lost the, tree, the axe head, he was more concerned about the fact that it was borrowed. The Bible tells us in verse number three, then one said, please consent to go with us. Actually, verse five. But as one was cutting down the tree, the iron axe head fell into the water and he cried out, alas, master, for it was borrowed. And so here what happens, he loses the axe head. And the first thing that comes to his mind is this axe head is not mine. 
it was borrowed. Maybe a friend lent it to him. And the thing that he was most concerned about, that maybe he had to pay back for this accent. Maybe he didn't have the money to pay for it. Maybe he was concerned about the fact that without this axe, the work of God is going to be seized. But the Bible says what well, he cried out to the man of God and said, I've lost this accent, but it was borrowed. And so the story ends with the miracle of the axe head floating. Now, how many know, those of you who do physics, how many know iron don't float? Come on, talk to me, church. And so we read about this miracle, about this axe head floating, but I want to look with you at one of the lessons that we can learn from this story of the axe head. Now, usually, when we read this story or when preachers tell this story, the focus is usually on the miracle of the floating axe head. And as a preacher, I must confess that when I begin to read this story or I begin to preach this story, I would get excited and encouraged about God's ability to do the impossible. How many still believe that the God that you and I serve, he is the God of the impossible? The Bible tells us that with men, things may be impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And anytime I read this scripture, I get excited because how many know sometimes we go through things in our lives? We go through things in our marriages we go through things in our finances we go through things in our family and in our health amen but listen regardless of what a doctor may say to you regardless of what the politicians may say to you regardless of what anyone else may say to you how many know that God can restore a broken marriage amen God can bless you where there seems to be no way God can open doors that are closed because the scripture tells us that the God that we serve this morning is the God of the impossible. And as we look in this text, many times we focus upon the miracle of the accent floating. But I want you to hear me this morning because the reason a miracle was needed in the first place is because a man lost something that didn't belong to him. Do you know many times where, when God does miracles in our lives, he does miracles because there is a problem. He does miracles because it, there's an issue that we cannot solve in our own strength, with our own wisdom, in our own ability. And here in this text, we're reading about a miracle that took place as a result of a man's mistake. But I want to take this a little bit or one step further. He lost the axe head because some point during its use, it became loose. Listen to the lesson of the axe head. Whenever things, or before rather, you lose things, they first become loose. Hear what the Holy Spirit would say to you today. Before you and I lose things, they first become loose. Before we begin to lose in areas of our lives, we first begin to slack. We begin to slack in our walk with God. We begin to slack in the way that we speak. We begin to slack in the way that we treat people. But hear me and hear me well, before you lose things, they first become loose. Fifteen years ago, I took my wife to paradise. I took her to the sunny tropical Caribbean island of Antigua and so I remember kind of just taking her there she wanted to know where I grew up and so I'm taking her to meet my family uh, I'm taking her to see my dad it was my grandmother's 80th uh, birthday at the time and so you know I, I'm showing her around I'm showing her my family my siblings who live there my father who lives there and so you know she, she was excited kind of excited to see all of them but what she really wanted is she just wanted to go to the beach She's just heard, you know, Antigua is the land of sun, sea, and sand. And so she's like, praise God, it's good. I've met your family. Okay, but let me go to the beach now. And so I remember taking her to this beach. And so it's a beach called Pineapple Beach. And so it's one of those beaches where the water is very shallow and it's very warm. And so when you go in, the, it's crystal clear water. You know, we just, I just came back yesterday from marriage retreat in, in South End. Uh, the water is different. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the sand is white where you can actually see. 
And so we were there, so we're enjoying ourselves. Uh, you know, just a bit further out, there's like a coral reef. And if you go to the other side of the coral reef, there's all kind of wildlife, you know, um, fishes where people go snorkeling. And so we're there in the beach having fun. And so I said, let's play this game where the waves, when the waves go out, you kind of go a little bit further out into the deep. When the waves come back in, you kind of run back. And so we're splashing around, just enjoying ourselves. And so I, I have this addiction. Anytime I see cricket on the beach, I end up going and playing. And so some guys were playing cricket on the beach. I said, hold on, babe, let me just go play with them. And so I'm playing cricket on the beach, and as I look down on her, she's just kind of looking in the water, kind of swimming around looking. So I, in my mind, I'm thinking, I wonder if there's fishes, because sometimes fishes would kind of swim by your feet. And so I came back. I said, what happened? And she gave me that look. She says, my ring. I said, what do you mean, your ring? She says, well, while I was splashing, it dropped off, but we're going to find it. Listen, she had faith, but I had doubt. Because I'm like, you know, man, by the time that ring drops, the sand is going to cover it. Listen, it is the grace of God if you find it. And so she was looking all over the place. She said, Jay, help me. I'm like, listen, it, it, it's finished. You're not finding that ring. You might as well give up now. It, it's going to be swept out into the tide, never to be seen again. And so sure enough, I helped her a little bit in there. We never found the ring, but let me tell you why she lost it. Just before we traveled to Antigua for probably four or five months, she went on this diet. And so she started exercising. And so what happened is that she went on this diet, she lost all of this weight, and her ring was loose. And I was warning her. I said, listen, you're going to lose that thing. How many of it gets loose is going to drop off? There's a couple of times where she's washing up the dishes and it kind of slips off and she picks it up and put it back on. I said, listen, we, we need to shrink that ring or do something or you're going to lose it. But she never listened to me. <laughs> and so here we are, splashing around in the water. And as a result of her ring being loose, she lost it. Can I say to you, beloved, that you have to watch out for the things that are beginning to loosen in your life. You have to pay close attention to the areas of your life where things are beginning to slack. And hear me, if you fail to deal with things that are loosening, you run the risk of eventually losing them. And my prayer this morning as we look into this word, amen, is that every one of us will stay where we need to be, amen, and keep our relationship with God and not allow things to be lost because they were first loose. My question to you today is what's loose in your life. If God was to come down and sit beside you in your chair and ask you what are the areas in your life that are beginning to become loose, what would you say? What are the areas in your life where you are beginning to slack? What are the areas in your life where you're beginning to cast off restraints and just kind of allow things to just play their course? Because hear me well, beloved, the scripture tells us that this man lost an accent that was borrowed as he was cutting down tree because some point during its use, it became loosened. There's a term in the Bible that I want you to think about with me this morning. And it is the term, gird up the loins. How many ever heard that term before? Where Jesus would say, gird up the loins of your mind. The Bible tells us to gird up the loins in various areas in our lives. And in other words, when you hear that term, what it is saying is that we need to hold things together. We cannot allow things to become loose or to become slack. And so all throughout the word, you will hear this term, gird up the loins. And so as I thought about the lesson of the accent, I realized something, beloved. And that is that we could prevent many things from being lost by simply tightening up the things that are slack in our lives. You now, a few years ago, before I went to Reading, I used to evangelize, and so I'll just go around various churches preaching. And so I remember I used to go to this particular church, similar to how I come here every year. I would go to this particular church on a yearly basis, and so I would minister there. And so the good thing about preaching around is that you begin to develop relationships and friendships. You see people who are serving God faithfully, and you become close, you become a kind of invested in them. And so I remember this particular church, every time I would go there, I would just fellowship with a number of people from the congregation. And so I remember going back one year, doing a revival. And 
there was a particular brother at the time he was the praise and worship leader. At the time, I remember him being a Bible study leader. I would always see him on the front line. He would rap. He would do all kind of music in the church. And so I remember coming, not seeing him the Sunday, not seeing him the Tuesday, the Monday rather. And then the Tuesday evening, I kind of asked the pastor, I said, where's brother so-and-so? I see his wife. I see his children. But he's not here. And so the pastor began to tell me how he began to slack in his walk with God. From being the praise and worship leader, he said, you know, he would begin to come to the services sporadically. Every now and again, you would see him. His family, his wife and his children, they were faithful, but he would just show up from time to time. And so the pastor began to tell me he became slack with his walk with God. And as a result of being slack with his walk with God, he became slack in his marriage. How many know it's not a good idea to slacken in your marriage? And so he begins to tell me how this man became an alcoholic where he started to drink. Not only just drinking alcohol, but he would get drunk. He would come home and his wife would say, this is not a good example. The children are seeing you. We're trying to bring them up in the fear and the admonition of God. But here you are, you're coming in and you're drunk and you're setting a bad example. And he would just brush her off. She began to tell the pastor how this man started spending hours of his time playing video games and isolating himself from his family. Now, listen, how many know no big man with children have any business spending hours of time playing video games? If you don't say amen, I'm going to preach on video games. But he will be there playing and the children are trying to get his attention. Can you take us to the park, dad? Oh, no, no, I've got to play this game. Oh, dad, can you do this with us? Oh, no, I'm playing this game. His wife is trying to get his attention. Honey, can we do something together? And he will spend hours, lock himself away in a room just messing around with video games. Everything is unraveling. He starts gambling. But not only is he gambling, is that he's gambling off all of the money that needs to pay the bills in the home. And as he's gambling, his wife is saying, what are you doing? Bailiffs are coming, knocking at the door. She's ashamed. She's like, you know, man, my, my, my husband, he, he, you know, she doesn't even know what to say. And he's gambling all the money. She's like, we have bills to pay. There's electric. There's all kinds of things. We're not on time with our bills. Listen, he said, just ignore the bailiffs. Just because you ignore them doesn't mean they're going to go away. And they kept coming, tormenting this poor young woman. Amen. Finally, what he does is that he moves out of his marital home and he goes back to live with his mother, leaving all of the bills and the debt to his wife. Any mother here, if your son do anything like that, send him back to the wife. Amen. Go take responsibility. And so I'm speaking to him and I'm like, my goodness, but he looked so on fire. He, he seemed so faithful. And listen to me, all this time, while all of this is happening, his Christian wife is begging him, stop slacking, honey. Sort things out. Get your life in order. Well, after three years of separation, she finally had enough. And she said, I want a divorce. And so she filed for a divorce. And it, as soon as she gives him the divorce papers, he starts saying, oh, no, no, I'm going to get things right now. He's trying to make it right, but it's been so long that she says, I'm done. He goes to the pastor and he's now instructing the pastor, you need to tell her to take me back. The pastor's not her father. He said, like, bro, I can kind of tell her what to do from the word of God. But just like when I was telling you for the last three years to get right and do what you need to do, you didn't listen to me. I'm trying to tell her and encourage her. But how many know it's her choice now? And so as a result of everything, they end up divorcing. Now he has to book time to see his children. Thank God she's a gracious wife. She wants him to see the children. But as I was thinking about this couple... All I could think of is how this man lost his family because he didn't tighten up the areas that were loose. If he had tightened things up, they were begging him to tighten things up. Things would have been very different. And I want you to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to you this, after, this morning. Before you lose things, they first become loose. Are you hearing me, church? Revelation chapter 3, verse number 1. We're going to read down to verse 3. The Bible says these words, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. 
Listen to what the instruction is. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. In other words, tighten up. That are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. It says, remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Here is Jesus. He's writing this letter to the church in Sardis. And as he writes to this church in Sardis, his instruction to this church, he says, I want you to be watchful, but also I want you to strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. In other words, you can see things are about to slip away. You can see things are about to be lost. He says, I want you to strengthen it, fortify it, hold them intact, amen, before you lose it. He says, secure it and tighten it, tighten it up before it is completely lost. And that is God's instruction to any one of us in here this morning where we're beginning to lose and, 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 and slackening our walk with him. His instruction to us is to strengthen the things that remain that are ready to be lost. We need to tighten up in various areas of our lives. Say amen, church. For some of you, God would deal with you about tightening up on how you spend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going I'm to talk about spending. You know, there's a precious sister I know. You know, one of the things about her is that she is extremely liberal, but on the other side of it is that she spends stuff that she doesn't need to spend. And the reason why I say she spends stuff that she doesn't need to spend is, listen, if you have it, I, I don't care. Spend as much as you want. But how many know if you're spending so much so that you spend everything, you never save, and then when a, a difficult season comes, now you're coming begging people for money. How many know you, you weren't wise with your money? And what she would do is that she would have these seasons where God blesses her and praise God and she just spend everything. And, you know, you always seen her posting pictures. I'm gone on this holiday. I've gone to this restaurant. I'm enjoying my life. And then the following week, she would come to me, oh, pastor, you know, man, I'll pray for me. I need a miracle. I can't pay my bill. I'm like, sis, there's something wrong. You need to tighten up. The Bible says go to the ant. And study the ant in the summertime. He saves his supplies. Amen. So when winter comes. How many know we need to save for winters? Some of you, God would say to you, you need to tighten up. Listen, you don't have to buy everything you see. I know people don't like this kind of preaching, but I want to help you today. Others, you need to tighten up on your words. Oh, but pastor, I'm just one of those people who I just got to say what's on my mind. The Bible says a fool speaks everything that's on their mind. How many know sometimes we have to refrain from speaking? Sometimes we need to just tighten up our I, I, I want to tell you something, but you know, I'm, I'm just going to hold it down. You know, I remember when I first got married. Actually, I didn't even first, get, we were dating, and so we were about to get married. And so I'm from Antigua. My wife is Nigerian. And so I remember going to her, her parents. And so, you know, the problem, first of all, is that I, I, I'm not Nigerian. The second problem is here I am. I'm saying that I want to preach the gospel, and I'm not a doctor. I, I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm just an ex-professional cricketer who got saved and now want to preach. And so I remember having this meeting, and all of her family is there, her mom, her dad, her brothers, her auntie, all kind of aunties. I don't even know if it's real aunties or you know how it is. And so I'm in this meeting, and so I'm being grilled. And I'm like, my goodness. And they're saying stuff, some things that are false. And they say, you know, how are you going to take care of my daughter? At the time, I, I, I'm a court supervisor. But they just put me into the category, oh, you're just a security guard. I'm like, no, I'm a court supervisor. Security guard. <laughs> and I remember I, I, I'm there in the meeting. And I remember they said something. This time it wasn't to me. The dad, her, her dad said something. It was to my wife. And I was vexed. But while I was there, I'm like, honor your father and your mother. Even though it wasn't my father, her father. And I kept quiet. And as all of them were grinning me, I, I feel like I'm in a court being cross-examined. I said no word, nothing, just like Jesus. Just kept quiet. If, if there was sand in the house, I'd have stooped down and right on the floor. <laughs> and I remember saying nothing, just kept quiet. And, and when it was all done, I remember her uncle and her aunt came to me came to her, my wife rather, and said, you have a man of God there. Because the way everyone was speaking, her, her uncle and they were Christians, said the way everyone was speaking, and I could see him, 
being uncomfortable, but he just held his peace. And he came get he, and you know what, man? I won them over. Amen. Hey, they love me now. Amen. <laughs> because how I many know sometimes you have to tighten up in what you're gonna say? Others of you, listen to this one. You have to tighten up in the way that you think. Because the devil assaults many of our minds. How many know the battle is in the mind? And so many of us listen to the lie of the devil. The devil starts telling you, you are no good. You can never become anything. No one loves you. No one cares. And in your mind, instead of thinking, I can do all things through Christ, you start thinking, no, I can't do it. I can't make it. I'll never become what I need to be. And listen to me, beloved. If you keep thinking like that, the enemy will destroy you. The Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind. Don't allow your mind to begin to drift to negativity. Don't allow your mind to drift to the things that you cannot do. Amen. Listen, if God is with you, you no devil or no demon in the underworld can be against you if God is in your corner how many know you will be victorious every time but what many of God's people do is they begin to think negatively they think about the things that they cannot do for the kingdom of God or the things that they cannot become and hear me church if you can think continue to think like that it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy you gotta tighten up your thinking so many times I speak to people and I'm just speaking to them about the mind. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. You know, there's a, a medical uh, term. I can't remember exactly what the term is. But it's this, this medical thing where people who, they, 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 they act, they're sick. But physically, physiologically, there's nothing wrong with them. And so they go, they run all kinds of tests. And they're doing all kinds of, you know, putting all kinds of, put them all kinds of machines. And they're running tests physically. There's nothing wrong because what they say is that if you begin to think a certain way, it can manifest in your body. You have to think very clearly, beloved, and tighten up the way that you think. Because the enemy will assault your mind. And if you don't tighten up, before things become lost, they, be first, they first become loose. Now, some of the reasons thing become, things rather become loose is one of the reasons is time. How many know over time, things have a tendency of becoming loose? The longer you have something, the longer you use something, the more chance it has of loosening. But just because things usually loosen as a result of time, how many know there's also the reality of things withstanding the test of time because people are able to take care of it you know i've seen people or i've seen things that withstood the test of time without being lost i've seen relationships that have withstood the test of time you know one of my heroes i always say is pastor warner and pastor mitchell and pastor camber I, I i love looking at all the preachers and i love hearing stuff like i've been serving god for 50 years i remember i remember going to tucson uh, back in 2010 it might have been to preach revival there it was my first time there in the church, uh, I was preaching a revival, and Pastor Warren invited me. And what shocked me is that I saw this old gentleman, he must have been in his, 50, in his 80s, and he was the usher. Eighty old man, he has gray hair, he has his glasses, he's limping, and he's taking people to their seat. And I'm asking, I said, how long has he been there? They said, he's been there since the very beginning. It's like 40-something years. And when I look at him, I had to go and talk to him. I said, what, what keeps you over the test of time? Things usually become loose. But here you are, you're still in your place. You're still serving God. You're still on fire. Listen, how many know we can learn valuable lessons by going to the elderly and learning from them? My question is, what causes things to remain intact over the long haul? And this might be so simple. That you might think, oh, Pastor, everyone knows this. Listen, if you're going to remain over the long haul, you need maintenance. Say maintenance. Things become loose because of a lack of maintenance. You've got to maintain your relationship with God and with people. And a failure to maintain certain things in life can be detrimental in the long run. I was reading an article about roller coasters these theme parks and they have all of these safety checks that they need to carry out but i was reading about the rigorous daily inspections on these roller coasters listen to what they had to do they said there are several items to be checked on the lift hill including 
the chain dampeners, the anti-rollback on the gearbox, the sprocket and intermediate chain, the chain and the chain tension. In the station and queue areas, uh, the station gates, air gauge, should be checked for proper alignment. All buttons and light on the operator's panel should be working correctly. Transfer tracks should be locked down in place. Brake shoes should be checked for excessive wear and proper alignment. All the wells on the handrails, the stairs, the catwalks are examined for cracks. And so what they're saying is that these are checks that are carried out every single day before anyone steps on a roller coaster, any one of these theme park rides, they go through all of these checks because they understand the importance of maintenance. They understand that with being used, things can begin to slack, things can become loose, and there can be a danger of people losing their lives or being injured, amen. And how many know, beloved, that one of the best things that you and I can do to maintain our walk with God is to have daily check-ins with Jesus people think oh prayer ah you're speaking about prayer again listen how many know prayer is powerful that every day we talk to God in prayer every day we read our Bibles amen have a check-in God what does your word say for me you know the Bible says give us this day our daily bread amen daily I'm gonna look into your word for strength daily I'm gonna fall upon my knees and cry out to you daily I'm gonna lift my hands and worship listen if we are going to have longevity as children of God we have to check in daily with Jesus in our text the Bible tells us that this axe head fell into the water. And could it be that it fell in because it wasn't properly maintained? They were just using it, but no one was tightening it up. They were using it, but no one was sharpening it. And the reality is, beloved, that here we have this text giving us a powerful lesson. And that is when things, before we lose things, they first become loose. But here is the hope in our text. The hope is that God can restore and recover things that are lost. How many thank God for that? Because he lost this accent, but God did a miracle and he recovered it. Let me just say this. What you and I lose naturally, God can restore supernaturally. Because just in the natural process of time, this man lost it and God restored it in a supernatural way. He didn't have to jump in and dive and begin to dig around. The Bible says, God, the man of God said, cut a piece of stick and throw it where it dropped in. And as he threw the stick, I don't know how it worked, amen, but the iron attached itself to the stick and then began to flow. What you and I lose naturally, God can restore supernaturally. I want you to be encouraged this morning, beloved, because you may have lost things in your life, amen, as a result of a lack of maintenance but can I say to you today that God is a restorer he can restore a marriage he can restore a broken relationship he can restore your health he can restore lost anointing he can restore a lost dream amen the Bible tells us this man lost his accent but God did a miracle and restored it and as you're here today I don't know what you may have lost but God has sent me to give you a message if you haven't lost it yet, he says, tighten things up. And if you've already lost it, he says, I can restore it. All you have to do is cry out to him, just like this man cried out, alas, man of God, it was borrowed. And God did a miracle. If you would cry out to God, he can restore whatever has been lost. How many believe it today? If you believe that, say hallelujah. God bless you. Bow your heads with me. We're